Hi, let's talk about media and communication once again. In the COVID-19 pandemic, the story of India's social health activist workers that demanded fair wages, better conditions, went a bit unnoticed. And we focus our conversation today on this, the poor health infrastructure in India and the challenges that are faced by frontline workers, especially women, who play a very important role in community-level healthcare. And we have the pleasure of welcoming Usha Rahman. She's from the Department of Communication at the University of Hyderabad in India. And she'll let us know more about how the care work uh, performed by these workers was portrayed in mainstream media. Okay, So today we explore uh, how media coverage overlooked their contributions, and uh, we stress the need to recognize and value women's caregiving work at all levels. Usha, welcome to our episode. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So right in the beginning of your article, you write, uh, we argue that care work, whether paid or unpaid, is positioned through media discourse as a natural and routine part of women's work, thus reinforcing a normalized construction of such work as gendered and simultaneously of high social yet low economic worth. Can you elaborate on, on this and about the importance of the study that you conducted? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so basically, it's not just at this point in time um, that women's work has been problematic in terms of how it's been valued economically um, in all discourses, whether you're looking at health or uh, family, uh, you know, family economics, we find that care work has been, um, it's been valued notionally in, in the sense that, you know, women are praised for um, being uh, amazing mothers, amazing caregivers, but um, there's been very little done to actually place an economic value on that work. And when it comes to healthcare, uh, you find that that becomes then um, a triple burden in a sense on a woman, right? So as a working woman, uh, you feminists have for long talked about the double burden, that is a woman bears the, the burden of care at home and of work outside the home. But when it comes to women health workers, there's the additional burden of care, which is an invisible part of the work that she delivers uh, in terms of um, providing health to communities. And uh, so, so that's really the core of our argument that uh, the care work that these volunteer workers do, so-called volunteer workers do, um, goes uh, economically unnoticed. Of course, I, I want to explore a little bit more this. Can you, so what were you hoping to find specifically? Let us know more about the research gap. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, so, um, you know, if you look at the paper, you'll find that we draw on uh, two broad frameworks. Uh, one is the feminist uh, economy of health, feminist political economy and the everyday political economy of health. And uh, what we uh, felt or what we were seeing through the pandemic was there was a lot of uh, celebration of um, the fact that frontline workers were doing so much uh, you know, amazing work, that they were uh, taking risks, that they were going into communities and providing care. Um, and so the expectation was that uh, the media would use this opportunity to perhaps uh, look a little more deeply at what exactly was going on in terms of women's work in health. Um, and uh, the pandemic in many ways uh, did open up our minds to different ways of thinking about health. Um, and so we thought this would have been an opportunity for the media also to reframe uh, the way women healthcare workers were doing their jobs and how we needed to value their work. So. Um, the research gap, in a sense, it was more of a knowledge and a perception gap. I think that we were hoping that media coverage would um, actually um, bridge. Um, and so we went in wanting to see what exactly how the media had covered these issues. A perception gap. It's, it's interesting. Let us know more about the findings then. Let's jump into them. Okay. So the way we did the study was, it was a classic um, media framing study in the sense that we looked at two major newspapers um, in the country and um, we wanted to see how they had covered uh, uh, women workers particularly 
during the COVID pandemic. Um, and um, so we did a, a textual analysis um, in the sense we first uh, did a search using keywords that uh, would yield or would allow us to harvest articles that talked about women workers, that talked about women workers in relation to the pandemic. Um, and um, we came up with um, a corpus of, um, you know, around 200 articles. Um, and um, and then we read these more closely to see how they had framed um, women in work, um, you know, what kind of language was used to talk about uh, the value of their work, if in fact the value of their work was talked about, what sort of terms were used to describe the women and um, their work. Um, so that's how we went about it. Um, so what we might call a classic uh, framing analysis of media. And what we found was um, a little disappointing, but perhaps not surprising. Um, we found that, uh, you know, there was a lot of mention of these women workers in India. We call them ASHA workers, that is accredited social health um, uh, act, uh, you know, accredited social health um, activists. And they're actually not, uh, they're supposed to be volunteers, but uh, they're paid a very small stipend in some states. And in other states, they are paid an incentive-based um, wage based on the number of homes they visit, the number of deliveries they assist in, you know, vaccinations, those kinds of things. So they're really very low paid at all times. And uh, what we found uh, through our uh, analysis was that um, there were two broad narratives that emerged in relation to how these women were covered in the media. And um, the first narrative was, um, was again, um, it was a complex narrative, but it was one where women emerged as uh, victims of the system. Um, and this was sort of a double um, uh, edged narrative, right? So, uh, what was uh, what was happening during the pandemic? And again, this is not just in India, but I think globally, it was found that uh, during the pandemic, women became particularly vulnerable, not just because they had less access to healthcare, but also because they uh, they ended up, um, you know, becoming much more vulnerable to home based violence, domestic violence, etc. So, um, so while that technically doesn't fall under the purview of our study as uh, about healthcare workers. What um, ended up happening was um, very often where we talked, where the stories talked about women, um, the victimhood was spread across um, categories of women. Um, so there were three categories of victimhood that emerged. One was you know, physical health related vulnerabilities um, that women uh, were more susceptible to. Um, and then the second was uh, domestic violence. And the third was economic distress. Now, um, how does ASHA work or how do the healthcare workers uh, fit into the scheme? Uh, very often the healthcare workers were also seen as victims of the system uh, without necessarily providing an answer to how the, this victimhood should be uh, should be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, the second uh, narrative that emerged, and perhaps this was the more dominant narrative, was women as selfless heroes. And um, again, this um, this echoes the findings of um, you know how women are portrayed, particularly women, women in caregiving roles are portrayed in other situations. In that, um, it shows uh, caregiving as a natural uh, part of women's work, um, not acknowledging that during the pandemic, actually, um, ASHA workers were not only um, reaching out to communities about, um, you know, precautions to take, uh, safe social distancing norms, those kinds of things, but uh, they were also providing psychological and emotional um, care to families, uh, you know, particularly in vulnerable communities. But um, this was often marked as something that, you know, was uh, was to be celebrated, but not necessarily compensated. So those were the two broad uh, things that we found. Okay. And very relevant now, I think, uh, from all you found, uh, is to explore the potential or existence already, potential policy impacts. What are they? Well, um, 
during the uh, coverage of the pandemic, um, you know, we we searched for articles, not just news stories, but also editorial pieces. And interestingly, there were just a handful, I mean, just about three or four editorial pieces that used this opportunity, used the focus on the context of healthcare to talk a little more about um, systemic issues, uh, including uh, issues of gender within uh, the healthcare space. And um, so there were, you know, there were uh, some people, particularly senior women scientists with the WHO um, and in uh, senior health administration in India, who did uh, in passing talk about uh, the need to look at uh, particularly ASHA workers more carefully and to recognize um, the care burden that was falling on them during such pandemics or during health emergencies. Um, but two or three articles in the space of a year um, is certainly not enough to impact policy. So the hope is that by um, making visible um, the the fact that these were issues that were not covered, that perhaps we can uh, nudge uh, people in health administration, people in health systems reform to think more carefully about what it means um, for women at really they're at the bottom of the caregiving ladder in, in terms of the health service delivery chain and what it means for them to provide such care uh, with little or no compensation. So um, I think what we've done is just the beginning um, in terms of bringing awareness to the issue. Um, and we're hoping that those who have more uh, of a role in policy making will pay attention to the work. Of course. Um, I'm curious to know more, and I think you started to touch upon that a bit. I'm curious to know more about future research venues. So where do we go from here? Um, so, you know, of course, what we've done is just look at the media and look at a very narrow slice of the media. Um, I think where we can go from here is to do a little more ethnographic work, mm -hmm. um, to talk to ASHA workers, uh, talk to communities to see how uh, they're perceived, um, and possibly also work with um, health economists to, um, to try and find if one can actually estimate the value of caregiving. Um, and um, that's a long road, of course. And, you know, I think feminist economists have talked about it in other contexts as well, that, um, you know, we really need to place an economic value on uh, emotional and psychological care that women provide, not just in roles that are defined as caregiving, such as the ASHA workers, but also in other roles where there is a significant emotional uh, or psychological care uh, component. Um, so I think working with health economists, doing a little more ethnographic work, uh, perhaps looking at uh, other media forums, right, uh, community media, to see if those are spaces where um, one can possibly change the way, um, you know, the perception gap can be closed. Um, so these might be other ways in which the work can be taken forward. So what we've done is really lay sort of a, a broad define the landscape and now we need to go in and pay more attention to the details of that landscape promising venues for the future usha uh, can you share some relevant resources that helps us and the listeners understand and engage with this topic further yeah so uh, we've uh, referred actually to a lot of the literature in the paper and um, I, you know i would suggest that uh, listeners can go back to our reference list and look at some of those uh, pieces. Um, specifically, I think work done during um, previous pandemics, for not pandemics, but previous health emergencies such as Zika and Ebola. Um, and that's where some of the, uh, you know, seminal work has come out of. So Sandra Harmon's work um, and, uh, you know, the work that uh, WHO uh, has been putting out on gender gaps in health um, and healthcare delivery, um, I think those are good resources, but also to look at uh, some of the work on um, feminist economy, uh, feminist political economy uh, that the ILO has been doing, uh, which recognizes uh, the burden of care as something that we need to seriously consider uh, and uh, you know, figure out how we as a society uh, really value both economically as well as in social terms. Well, that's good. And uh, for our listeners that are 
watching this episode on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication websites. Uh, below the video, you can find the recommended materials uh, that Usha just suggested uh, to further explore the topic. And now, Usha, um, to close this episode, the end of your article, it has a very important message, too long to, to say here, but basically reads uh, that we need to value healthcare and remove its gendered associations and then incorporate these perspectives into journalism training uh, to, to foster a deeper understanding of social issues. So is this the main message of your article or is there something more you want to add? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, since both Sumana and I, Sumana Kasturi is my co-author, um, Sumana and I come from a media studies background. Um, we hope that the work we do will go back uh, to inform the practice of media. And um, and I think um, a lot of um, our attention was on how the media covered this. So if we want to start to address that perception gap, it is it has to start with the media. So definitely, I think you know training journalists on um, on understanding the nuances of healthcare, on appreciating the gendered aspects and how they need to think about them uh, could probably help. Thank you, Usha. Thank you. If you are watching us on YouTube, you can find all the resources and the materials of this conversation on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication website. And you can also listen to this episode uh, wherever you, you get your podcast.